Tonight on News Center, the Korean government announces that it will publish history textbooks for use in schools from 2017, taking a necessary step to strip current teaching of what it says is ideological bias. Tensions peak with the U.S. and China in the South China Sea. The United States says its naval operations near territory claimed by China are designed to defend freedom of navigation in international waters. And it's unlikely that the Chinese economy is headed for a hard landing, but Korea's exports will be hard hit if the nation's largest trading partner slows down below a certain level, that is, according to the Bank of Korea. This is News Center. It's Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015. Good evening to our viewers here in Korea and hello to those around the world. The South Korean government has made it official. It will publish history textbooks for use in the nation's middle and high schools from 2017. That's a necessary step to strip current teaching of its ideological bias that's according to the Seoul government. Well, the move to stop use of textbooks written by private sector scholars and issued by private publishers have capped weeks of debate in this country. First on the government's announcement today, here's our Chi myung -gil. Prime Minister Hwang kyo wan and Education Minister Hwang woo called on the public to support the government's textbook plan. Speaking at the government complex in Seoul, the Prime Minister said they want to provide students with history textbooks that are not biased and present what they call a proper description of Korean history. We cannot teach our children using history textbooks that are distorted and biased. The government will publish textbooks that are based on objective fact and that are faithful to Korea's constitutional values. The Prime Minister went on to say that the government cannot rely on the current system, in which eight private companies publish history textbooks, pending government approval. Although the government recommends private history textbook publishers to revise distorted contents, they have a tendency to refuse suggestions, even filing lawsuits against the government. Education Minister Hwang Wuyo sought to reassure the public about concerns that the government would try to whitewash modern Korean history. He said the public has no reason to worry. Considering Korea's social maturity, it would be unthinkable to publish history textbooks with favorable description of Japanese collaborators or their country's military dictators and related events. By mid-November, the Education Ministry hopes to put together a team of history scholars and teachers who will write the books. The National Institute of Korean History will be in charge of making the historical content neutral and ensuring the books have a balanced perspective. Kim young Arirang News. And how is Parliament reacting to the government's decision to stick with its history textbook plan? Well, uh, the opposition bloc has been adamantly against the move, and with today's announcement, the party has vowed to continue its protests. Arirang News parliamentary correspondent Park ji joins me from the National Assembly. Now, ji uh, reactions from the main opposition? Good evening, Kanyang. The government is the object of vehement protests from the main opposition party and a bipartisan clash ended up delaying a scheduled parliamentary session on Tuesday. Lawmakers from the New Politics Alliance for Democracy Party have been protesting at the National Assembly since Monday night when the government's decision to move forward with its textbook plan was made official. Party leader Moon Jae-in characterized the move as dictatorial. Our party will stand with the public. We will confront this group that opposes liberal democracy, and we will confront dictatorship. We will protect academic freedom and neutrality in education. Party floor leader Lee jong also criticized the government for not taking enough time to collect opposing views on the issue from the public. He said the party had delivered a petition to the education ministry with more than a million signatures opposing the government decision, but the government hasn't taken it into consideration. 
Vowing to continue its protest, the party boycotted a planned parliamentary session on Tuesday, which also caused a confirmation hearing for the prospective Fisher's minister to be delayed. The ruling Senate party, which sides with the government on the issue, slammed the opposition for the boycott. The party said lawmakers should instead focus on their jobs and deal with other more pressing issues, such as the current deliberations over next year's budget. The MPAD is turning a blind eye to the people's livelihoods and using history education as a means of political gain. This shows the party is only thinking about elections. Addressing concerns about the government's motives, the party vowed to keep the textbooks free of descriptions that gloss over South Korea's dictatorial past, saying society would not allow that to happen. Well, for now, it's hard to say when or how the standoff between the parties will be resolved, but it looks like it will continue for quite a while. Kan Young? Well, uh, definitely so. Uh, thank you, Chiwon, for that. Seoul and Tokyo made a landmark agreement at Summit Talks on Monday to work together to address Japan's wartime sex slavery issue. But uh, questions linger over how committed Tokyo truly is to resolving the matter while the victims are still alive. Our foreign affairs correspondent Song ji Sun follows up on the story. In an interview aired after his return to Japan on Monday, Prime Minister Abe once again reiterated Tokyo's stance that its wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women was settled in a 1965 treaty that normalized relations between Seoul and Tokyo. But he also said efforts would continue towards resolving the issue. Finding a resolution that is supported wholly by both countries will not be easy. However, Abe expressed that it should be possible to find common ground through negotiations. Here in Seoul, reviews are mixed on whether the bilateral summit was a success. Some, including surviving victims, think no major headway was made since no day was set to reach a final resolution. The Korean government must proactively act towards resolving this matter before the end of the year. Tokyo should admit to its wrongdoings now and ask for forgiveness. I want our dignity and honor to be recovered before we all die. Progress between the two sides has been more stop than go, but with fresh vows to create a resolution, there is renewed hope moving forward. The two countries will work to resolve the sex slavery issue at the earliest possible date through official high-level talks as held previously. As for the schedule of the meetings, we'll arrange the date with diplomatic agendas in mind. This means that 10th round of high-level talks on the wartime sex slaves could be held in the coming days or weeks. There are also chances that separate diplomatic channels could be used to conclude negotiations by the end of the symbolic year, which marks the 70th anniversary of Korea's independence. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. Tensions between the United States and China are on the rise, with both countries imposing their presence over waters near artificial islands built by China in the South China Sea. Well, the U.S. says it has a right to be in that area and does not recognize China's claim of sovereignty. And neither side seems ready to back down. Connie Kim reports. A top U.S. defense official says a freedom of navigation operations by the United States should not be viewed as a threat to any nation after the U.S. challenged China's claims to artificial islands it's building in the South China Sea. U.S. Pacific Command Commander Admiral Harry Harris said Tuesday during a trip to China, Washington has been conducting freedom of navigation operations all over the world for decades, so no one should be surprised by them. He also reiterated that the U.S. takes no position on competing sovereignty claims to land features in the area. Underscoring the U.S. assertion, a U.S. defense official had said Tuesday, the U.S. Navy plans to conduct patrols within the 12 nautical mile limit about twice a quarter. Tensions between Washington and Beijing escalated last week after an American destroyer sailed within 12 nautical miles, or 20 kilometers, of the man-made islands China claims. 12 nautical miles around a territory is internationally recognized as sovereign territory, but the U.S. does not recognize China's claim to artificial islands in the area. The Spratleys are a disputed group of more than 750 reefs, islets, atolls, caves, and islands claimed by China and four other countries, including Vietnam and the Philippines. Beijing has so far held firm on its stance, saying it'll never allow any country to violate its territorial waters and airspace in the area. 
in a meeting with former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger on Monday. Chinese President Xi Jinping said the two countries should deal with the issue from a strategic position seen as indirect pressure on Washington to back down. In an apparent response to the U.S. challenge, China's Navy reportedly sent a fighter jets over the Spratlys on Friday after the U.S. sailed by. Retired Chinese General Xu Guangyu noted that it's the minimum level of response China should have, or it'll fall short of public expectations. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And amidst all this, the two-day ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting kicked off in Kuala Lumpur on Tuesday, where ASEAN nations, along with dialogue partners, are scheduled to discuss regional security issues. We connect to our defense ministry correspondent, Kim Hyun Bin. He is at the scene for details. Kim Bin. Uh, that's right. I'm here in Kuala Lumpur where the third ASEAN Defense Minister meeting is underway. Uh, defense Minister Han ming is here and held talks with his counterpart from Myanmar. But before we get into the details, let's take a look at what this meeting is all about. The ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting focuses on regional security and enhancing defense cooperation among the participating countries. The 10 ASEAN nations and its eight dialogue partners, including the U.S., Korea, China, Russia, and Japan, are scheduled to hold a general meeting on Wednesday. A Korean Defense Minister official said Tuesday that the South China Sea dispute is expected to top the agenda at this year's meeting, as China continues to build artificial islands in the area. South Korea has taken a neutral stance on the issue. The official added the South Korean defense minister is expected to raise the issue of North Korea's nuclear program and the reunification of the two Koreas. At the ASEAN defense minister's meeting, Defense Minister Han min gu is urging the participating nations to show support to denuclearize North Korea. Minister Han held his first bilateral defense talks with his counterpart from Myanmar, Chen Wen, on Tuesday and is scheduled to meet with his Chinese, Indonesian and Malaysian counterparts soon after Wednesday's general meeting. This is the first meeting of its kind in two years, since the one in Brunei in 2013. Thanks, Hyunbin. And now for a more in-depth look into uh, this issue, we are joined live in the studio by Dr. Kim hyun -wook. Dr. Kim is a professor at the Korean National Diplomatic Academy. Uh, Dr. Kim, good to have you in the studio. Thank you. Well, uh, first and foremost, why this showdown between the U.S. and China? I mean, what are the points of contentions here? Uh, when you look at the uh, case, uh, I think uh, two, two countries have different positions towards this area. China argues that this area has been occupied historically uh, by China, and China effectively occupies this region. So, you know, whatever China does on this uh, island, whether building some man-made, uh, you know, some facilities is uh, pretty much free and, and it's the sovereignty of China. Mm -hmm. But the United States argues that this is a conflict area, uh, so not completely uh, belonging to the Chinese side. So there should be a freedom of navigation guaranteed. But more underlying um, uh, reasons for the conflict between two countries is that um, this area is very important for China to uh, have a pathway towards uh, the uh, more global sea, sea shores, so that uh, sea, seaways, because uh, that guarantees a lot of economic benefits to China. So, in order to guarantee the U.S. hegemony in this region, the U.S. by the rules and standards of international law now trying to limit the Chinese behavior. Right. Um, so the third ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting um, is taking place as this spat is going on. Uh, this is the first meeting of, of such kind where Washington and Beijing officials are at one place uh, since the U.S. Navy destroyer sailed within 12 nautical miles uh, mm -hmm. of this artificial island claimed by China. Mm -hmm. What do you expect the neighboring countries' reactions to be? Well, countries have all different postures towards these issues. Um, uh, first, the Philippines has uh, indicted uh, China to the Permanent Court of Justice about this issue, and then the court recently received this and accepted this to be the, uh, the issues to be dealt by the court itself. So I think it's a very important timing. Uh, other countries like Australia, Japan, uh, even, uh, even some countries like uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, supports the uh, U.S. positions. 
I think the only country that supports Chinese position is uh, Cambodia. So I think uh, the general atmosphere of the meeting is pretty much negative uh, towards China, and I think the U.S. position is pretty much favorable. So I think um, you know Chinese uh, backlash and the opposition to the all other countries' opposition to the Chinese uh, uh, recent behaviors in South China Sea would be, I think, a very uh, you know, active and uh, very uh, assertive, I think. So uh, it seems like U.S. has more backing than China over this issue. What about South Korea? I mean, South Korea has been playing a very delicate balance between its traditional ally, U.S., of course, and its strong neighbor, China, in recent days. Um, but just a few days ago, of course, uh, South Korea's defense minister, Han min mm -hmm. he called uh, for freedom of skies and seas this during a joint news conference with Ashton Carter uh, here in Seoul. It was the strongest public remarks made by a South Korean official over this matter. What is the stance of South Korea? And in your view, how should South Korea deal with this issue? Well, Korea's uh, having a very good relationship both with the United States and China. Uh, Xi Jinping and uh, President Park Geun-hye is uh, having a very close relationship. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping's China and uh, Park Geun-hye has South Korea. Their relationship has developed a lot so far. Um, and also China is a very important country for the economic benefit and also the North Korean issues. So we cannot e exactly uh, you know, deny the role of China in this region. But recently, China, uh, President Park Geun-hye visited the United States and uh, you know, uh, the President Obama affirmed that the, uh, the South Korea-China relationship and the uh, U.S.-Korea relationship is not zero-sum game. And, but at the same time, President Obama clearly mentioned that uh, if China's behavior is, uh, is, uh, is not obeying the international rules and law, you know, South Korea should speak out on it. So I think uh, the, 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 the position of South Korea should be very neutral, uh, pretty much you know, sticking to the principles. So uh, as you mentioned that uh, you know, the defense minister Han Min-gu and also the, uh, white, uh, the, the, the presidential office, uh, I think it was last week, uh, mentioned that uh, the South Korean position is that it supports uh, the you know, behaviors uh, you know, based upon the rules of international order and international law. And if some conflicts happen, that should be uh, solved very peacefully. So I think uh, you know, South Korean position is very much you know, sticking to the principle, rather neutral, not sticking into the, any, any side of, uh, uh, in between the United States and China. Right, and um, I believe that that will the, be the course of action China, or South Korea, excuse me, will take in the future mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. All right, um, thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Kim Yeonuk, for this, uh, your insights, and we hope to see you again. Thank you very much. The Bank of Korea believes China is not headed for a hard landing, but uncertainty surrounding the world's second largest economy still poses major threat, especially to dependent emerging markets. Kim Minji reports. Uncertainties in China could increase global market volatility down the line. In a report, the Bank of Korea said China's slowdown will ignite concerns over a global economic downturn as it contributes largely to the growth of the world economy. Currently, the powerhouse is on track to posting its worst economic growth in 25 years. In the third quarter, China's GDP grew 6.9 percent from a year ago, dropping below 7 percent for the first time in over six years. And now there are doubts that China will reach its growth target of about 7 percent this year. Korea's central bank says China's slowing growth will especially lead to bigger concerns for markets that are heavily dependent on the Chinese economy. Korea, for example, with more than a quarter of its outbound shipments heading to China, has seen its exports dip every month so far this year. The report said although there appears to be little chance of a hard landing for China's economy due to expansion in investments in infrastructure and solid growth in the service sector, developments like a U.S. rate hike could spell trouble. The central bank says market volatility could expand with the possibility of capital outflow from emerging economies.
But thanks to strong economic fundamentals and ample foreign reserves, the central bank says impact on Korea should be limited, but it will still closely monitor external uncertainties. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Well, Korea's reliance on China for trade may be at a record high, but overall export figures have plunged. Now, many are looking for the Korea-China FTA to be ratified as soon as possible in order to reap the huge benefits that both governments have promised. Our Kwon Soa has this report. Korea's dependence on neighboring China has grown to its highest level ever. It accounted for 23.2 percent of Korea's imports and exports in the first three quarters of the year. That's up 1.8 percentage points compared to last year. But by volume, shipments to China are actually on a downward trend. Exports dropped 8 percent in October on year. This means the high reliance on China is more reflective of Korea's shrinking exports to other major trade partners. Demand for Korean products in Japan is deteriorating as they've lost price competitiveness due to the weak yen. And China's slowing growth is a concern, too. That's why experts say it's time for new strategies. In the short term, new partnerships with other emerging countries should be sought out. But what's more important is developing better footing in the Chinese market, meaning targeting sectors such as tailored consumer goods exports. The Korea-China FTA should help give those exports a boost, too, but only if it takes effect soon. Because of the concern uh, for domestic industry injury, uh, both governments actually delayed the market liberalization. Other FTA typically try to eliminate all the existing tariff within three, maximum five years. But in, in Korea and China FTA, we had to delay the complete market liberalization in 10 year or even 20 year. A longer delay could come with a high price. President Park Geun-hye has said it could result in daily export earnings losses of 3.4 million U.S. dollars. Experts say now is the golden time. In order for the trade pact to take effect this year, the Korean parliament needs to complete the ratification process by the end of this month. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. We've seen the global economic growth forecast get slashed, China's GDP projections downgraded. All things economy seem everything but sound these days. Should we really be worried about what lies ahead? I sat down with the managing director and chief financial officer of the World Bank Group, Bertrand Baudry, to get an expert's view. So China and Asia's GDP forecasts have been reduced. Should we be worried about this? Well, we should always be worried when things are changing. And the truth is that it's, it goes much beyond China today. I mean, there are three adjustments uh, happening at the same moment. All of them are welcome. I mean, we knew that China growth was not sustainable. You cannot grow at 10, 12% forever. We knew that the quantitative easing policy uh, supported by the Federal Reserve in the US was not sustainable forever. And we knew the commodity cycle was, as people say, supercharged. So all of this had to come back to reality at some stage. The main issue is that everything is happening at the same stage. Mm -hmm. So what is scary is, is a conjunction of the three. So we know that the end game is a positive end game, that we come back to something which is more manageable. Mm -hmm. What we have to manage is a transition. We know where we are at point A, we know where we want to be at point B, and we have to make sure we have no disruption in the middle. That's where we really require everybody's collaboration, cooperation, and, and avoid any type of unnecessary conflicts or, or challenges. So what is the world being doing to achieve that? I, I think that's why 2015 is a very important year, because you have all these forces which play uh, a, a dispersion role. And people are nervous when, when, this, when things are slowing down, when things are uncertain, you tend to be more selfish, to concentrate on your own issues. But at the same time, I mean, it's very important. This year, we had three major conferences. The first one in Addis Abeba in Ethiopia this July about financing for development. We had in New York in September the endorsement by 192 countries of the Sustainable Development Goals. And we will have soon in Paris the COP21 on climate. So it's very interesting to see this year where you have these dispersion forces, this kind of worrying forces. At the same time, the strong efforts of international community to gather and find a momentum together. And we have to I mean, to relay a lot on that. We have to push on that. We have to 
trigger all the, all, the, all the forces to make sure we remain as united as possible. Uh, let's talk about AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Do you welcome the competition? For me, it's, it's a welcome move. And I don't say that because I want to be nice. I really mean it. I mean, we cannot argue on the one end that the world is lacking $1 to $1.5 trillion every year in infrastructure finance and complain because a new guy coming will provide 10, 20 billion per annum. We still have a huge gap. So I really welcome them on board. We are working with them. I mean, we really want to have them go off ground next year. So we are engaged with them. I think it's, it's a positive. What is your assessment of the quantitative easing program? Do you think it was effective? But the truth is that the U.S., even if it's not as fast as in the past recovery, even if it has taken more time, even if it's somewhat more tepid than in the past, I mean, the U.S. economy is, is back to something like close to 5% unemployment rate, even if it's at the price of a drop in the participation rate. The U.S. economy is above 2% growth rates. So the U.S. economy is kind of back on track. So whether it's due entirely to the Fed or to other factors, I mean, that's for economists to decide. But I think this is, this is really something that has happened, and it is good for the global economy, definitely. Do you foresee the U.S. exiting out of the QE3 uh, this year? I, I, I don't have a date. They will exit someday. Mm -hmm. we, have the, we have told them, I mean, the World Bank as an institution has told them to, to be cautious on the impact. Uh, and they, they, they said, I mean, they are definitely focused on U.S. domestic policy, but they take into account the fact that international circumstances might have a spillover effect on the U.S. economy. So they are considering the broader perspective, and so this will happen ultimately. And at the end of the day, it's good that it's happening. The question mark is how to make sure the transition is happening okay. Initial black box examinations show the Russian jet that crashed killing hundreds on board was not struck from the outside, but officials still haven't ruled out an act of terrorism. Well, Bruce Harrison joins me live in the studio. Bruce, are there any new theories as to how this uh, jet crashed? Well, Konyang, it's still really unclear what happened, but there are a handful of theories. Uh, the Guardian newspaper compiled a list. Among them, a U.S. satellite detected a heat flash, as it's called, above the Sinai Peninsula at the time of the crash. Now, that could indicate a bomb exploding or maybe even an engine exploding. And a Russian news agency said that there were parts or elements not part of the plane found at the crash site. Also, experts say it's less likely now the plane was shot out of the sky. Right, and Egypt is saying that the Islamic State had nothing to do with that crash, right? An Islamic State affiliate uh, said originally that it shot the plane down. Egypt says that's not what happened. You know, it's uh, hard to acknowledge that there are militant forces operating with your, within your borders and blowing up planes for a number of reasons, especially tourism. It's not good for the state. Now, Egypt has said that it's safe to travel there. Of course, um, this happened, oddly enough, at the same time, Egypt was launching a new tourism initiative in London to promote tourism at home. It's unclear what impact the crash will have. The Russian market to Egypt is a big market. It's the biggest market for the, for the Egyptian tourism. So it, it's got the potential to be quite damaging, but it will, yeah, it will, it will depend. I'm sure. Egyptian President Abdel al-Sisi said it could take months to find out why the plane went down and he's cooperating with Russian investigators. Now, until the investigation's over, some foreigners in Egypt are taking precautions. The Guardian reports the U.S. banned embassy staff from traveling to the Sinai Peninsula and the British Foreign Office banned all citizens. The EU is testing a new way to speed up the registration of refugees clamoring to get into Europe. The process is being used on the tiny Greek island of Lesbos with plans to expand it to the rest of the continent if it works. 300,000 people fleeing war and poverty have come through the island, one of the main hot spots to get into the European Union. The Associated Press reports the new plan, pro, pilot program rather, includes translators and police interviewers. They use a secret questionnaire to help quickly determine which country the migrants came from. According to the Associated Press, the program's humble housed in a converted freight container. It's also surrounded by razor wire and guarded by riot police. Plenty of security. Germany said this week it expects fast-track registration centers to begin operating at other migrant hotspots by the end of the month. An estimated 700,000 refugees and migrants have arrived in Europe this year. Along dangerous sea and land routes, many have died making the journey. 
Well, in another news, history has been made in uh, the most Australia's most prestigious uh, horse race. Horse, uh, horse race, a female jockey has won the Melbourne Cup for the first time. Exactly. This is a big deal in Australia. It's, it's the biggest race. The jockey, Michelle Payne, and her horse, Prince of Penzance, are going home with a lot of prize, uh, pride, rather. And the, and the prize is uh, more than $2 million U.S. dollars, so it's quite a big purse. Right, quite a big purse. And um, this really brings down the barriers in that sport. And Payne wasn't shy about bringing that up after her win, right? Yeah, she talked to the press after she won, and uh, she was pretty frank. She said uh, she's thanking her trainer for sticking with her. In her own words, uh, quite a chauvinistic sport. Payne said she hopes to inspire more female jockeys around the world with her win. Being patient. And I'm so glad to win the medal. And hopefully it'll, it'll help female jockeys from now on to get more of a go because I believe that we sort of don't get enough of a go. And, and hopefully this will help. Prince of Penzance's win was a triumph for Payne's family. Many of her siblings are jockeys, and her brother, who has Down syndrome, is the horse's strapper. A real family affair there, Bruce. Indeed, and, and a quick note, uh, the horse was passed up by a different buyer earlier this year, so whoever that person was is probably kicking himself now that he's seen the big win. I'll bet, I'll bet. All right, uh, thanks, Bruce, for that today, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Well, extreme dry weather and the major gap in temperatures from day to night, it's causing many to get sick these days, including our very own weathercaster, Jihan. Jihan, how are you feeling? Hello, Ganyang. Thank you for asking. I am getting better, but I know I'm not alone with this weather, as Ganyang just mentioned. There's a higher chance of catching a cold with higher cold activity levels, so be sure to take good care of your health. And you know, getting vaccinated would be a good way to avoid getting cold or flu. Now, when the sun is out, temperatures are very mild enough to enjoy the outdoors, and tomorrow should be a repeat of today's weather. Chilly morning and mild afternoon under mostly sunny skies by afternoon. But levels of fine dust and ultra-fine dust particles are likely to increase during the day. So if you plan to be outside or want to open up the windows, be sure to check air quality first. On that note, let's move on to tomorrow's temperature readings. Daily high here in Seoul will hike up to 19, while Daegu and Gwangju climbs to 21, and Busan tops out at 22. And as for the other regions, Daejeon and Jeju Island will see a high of 20 while Tokdo peaks at 19. Now, typical late autumn weather with plenty of sun will be featured through the rest of the week. We have rain in the forecast over the weekend, but that shouldn't really affect the temperatures that much. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's international weather for viewers around the world. And that is our broadcast on this Tuesday evening. I'm Moon Gun Young. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you right back here, same time tomorrow on News Center.